Well, one day, the Pac-12, led by Oregon State and Washington State, can absolutely rebuild. Their focus should be football. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pack 12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights free and Pack 2 dominated and beloved Conference of Champions, which does still have a team left to play a football game with that Pac-12 sticker on the jersey. Please like, comment, subscribe, rate, review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Lots coming up on today's show, including what a Washington win would mean for the Pac-12 and whether or not everybody else uh, gets a sizable amount of cash should they uh, knock off Michigan, which, spoiler alert, I think they're going to do. But more on that coming later. So the Pac-12, Pac-2, however you, want to look, however you want to look at it, can theoretically rebuild. I've talked about this before on the show, but with the, the outsized share of money that Oregon State and Washington State got and the resources and the con- legal control of the Pac-12 and uh, you know as it exists as a legal entity, the rebuild is 100% possible. If you're thinking about how to build that conference, in my view... That should be a football-driven decision. Most of these decisions are made on football. Now, you may be saying, everydayers out there who've been with me for a while, first of all, appreciate you. Second of all, you may be thinking to yourself, Spencer, what about your motto that's going on your gravestone? Presidents vote on realignment. Fact fact check true. Fact check true. And guess what? A lot of presidents really like football and understand the value that it brings to the university. So, you know, Florida State in their settlement, or not settlement, their lawsuit against the ACC, said the ACC missed the whole point of realignment by not adding the best football teams. Well, I mean, that's true. Cal and Stanford were not the best football teams out West they could have added, but that's who got added to the ACC because those reasons go beyond just football. But if you're Oregon State and Washington State thinking about, okay, how do we secure our athletic and to another extent as well, our financial futures as universities going forward in realignment. If we're going to rebuild the Pac-12 into a new conference, into a new era, into the premier group of five conference in all of college football, which is what it would be, as I talked about earlier this week on the show. The answer is you focus on football. You focus on football and you ignore just about every other factor. And with Oregon State and Washington State, they, they've never been, though they both have you know good elements about their schools. Washington State, uh, or Oregon State rather, has got, I think, a good medical school and whatnot, but they're not academic powers. They're not research hubs. They don't carry that sort of cachet and pedigree the way a Stanford and Cal would, for instance, or the Big Ten or the ACC, the way they view that sort of stuff. So I think those considerations can be put to the side because Oregon State and Washington State as universities want to be able to to compete at the highest level. The way you do that is build the best football conference. And I think if you do that, you could even, you could think about this crazy idea that just popped into my head, but that's a lot of how this show works is ideas pop into my head or you send me ideas and I talk about it. Could the PAC 12 create a football only conference? It's possible. It's I'm not saying it's a great idea. I'm just saying it's possible. There's precedent at the FCS level, not at the group of five level necessarily, but there is precedent for it. And you have a school like Hawaii, for instance, that competes in football in the Mountain West. All their other sports, they're in the Big West. It can be done. It could be done. It's a new world. All ideas are on the table. But when you're looking at football, That's what's driving all this sort of stuff. And you're trying to get the best television deal possible. You're not going to get anything close to what, you know, they would have been making even with the Apple deal in the Pac-12 or anything they were making previously or could be could have been making if if things hadn't broken up. But you're trying to maximize the opportunity, make lemonade out of lemons here. 
And the way you do that is you focus on football. And I think when you're assessing schools, you can maybe think about basketball as a backdrop idea, but this should be, and, and by the way, think about the Big East. There are schools that play basketball in the Big East. There's that's that's a basketball only conference. They don't have football anymore. They used to. Their football teams all decided to go elsewhere. That's a slightly different scenario, but I'm just saying it doesn't seem like it's out of the realm of possibility. But my point is that football needs to be the driving force. Football is what people care about the most. If you're going to get a media rights deal in a couple years, and I think though this would be you know an aggressive move, the sort of move that killed the Pac-12. It's hunter be hunted. That's the world we're living in here. If Oregon State and Washington State were to play as de facto independents as they will for 2024, if they were to do that in 2025 and start rebuilding the conference in 2026, that's when the Mountain West media rights deal expires. You could take the best teams from the Mountain West, pair them with some schools from the American, led by Oregon State and Washington State, there's your new Pac-12, and then go to their media rights partners, that being the Mountain Wests, and say, hey, instead of going there, you obviously want to come over here because this is where the valuable television commodities are, plus we're here as well, making this new league. So if you're going to go in that direction, football is the way that that it should be oriented. I, I think you should look at schools and say almost entirely, just look at their football team. What is their football program done? What can their football program be? What's the history, tradition, brand, all that sort of stuff, television ratings, all that should factor into it. So this stems from a question that came in via the mailbag, which is always open, YouTube comments or Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore pack 12 DMs and mentions wide open. Uh, this question from Big Rig U. When it comes to rebuilding the Pac-12, would it be worth looking beyond just focusing on football? Specifically, we know that Commissioner of the Big 12, that's Brett Yormark, wants to add Gonzaga to the Big 12, and the Big East is also at least somewhat interested in Gonzaga as well. The answer is no, because in media rights valuation, basketball – has some value. It, it It's a component of it. Best estimates are it's in the 15% range. So are you going to make a primary decision that's based on 15% of an entity's total value? My guess is no. That's not good business practice. The conferences that are thinking about adding Gonzaga, the Big 12 or the Big East may have expressed interest. I haven't really looked into all that sort of stuff. Those are leagues that already have an established foundation and can afford to try and build up basketball as best they can. You can't worry about building up basketball until you have leveled up football to a place where you command national respect and a legitimate media deal. So I, I don't think that non-football considerations should really come into play. I don't think there are academic factors. I don't think there are cultural factors. I don't think there are geographic factors. I think we've thrown, for the most part, geography out the window. I mean, that, that's been the biggest lesson of realignment, right? USC is in the same conference as Maryland. Don't tell me that geography matters. It's why my, my proposal for rebuilding the Pac-12 one day is six teams from the Mountain West, and you can debate, and I'm going to talk about another one that I may have overlooked, for, for a particular reason in that conversation. But I think everyone readily agrees on the four best college football teams, brands, programs, whatever you want to refer to it as in the Mountain West, Boise State, Fresno State, San Diego State, and Air Force. And then from there, you can pick the next two in a number of using a, a, a variety of, of criteria. But grab those four, grab four out of the American, Memphis, Tulane, probably UTSA, and, and South Florida and go all the way back uh, back on the other side of the country. And that's your new Pac-12. But you, that that is the best football conference you can make. That's where the Pac-12's priorities need to be. Have I been overlooking a school out of the Mountain West? Maybe. Maybe. I did some digging. Game time will do the digging for you or do all the legwork that you want them to do because – Think about this. When you're buying tickets to your next big event, do you want to worry about whether or not you're going to get stuff, whether or not you're going to get a deal, whether you can easily get tickets? You shouldn't have to. And with game time, you don't. Because game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork 
out of buying tickets. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase, and you can buy tickets in seconds with just two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Take it out. Don't put it in. Take it out. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Okay, so in that hypothetical world in which the pack gets rebuilt, Oregon State, Washington State, four American schools, and six schools from the Mountain West. The top four, if you're looking at football pedigree, are pretty clearly Boise State, Fresno State, San Diego State, and Air Force. And assuming the Pentagon would be okay with that, Air Force would be the place to go. I don't know if they've got a high ceiling, but they have a really high floor, a really, really high floor. Where you go for the next schools, I've left those two open to interpretation. Heck, the the PAC wouldn't even technically have to add two more if they didn't want to. I just think that in this world, if you're trying to build a a, a competitive conference and one that has some durability, you want to have more teams in it. What has the Big 12 done? Added teams. What did the Big 10 do? Added teams. SEC, ACC. They're all adding teams. And having just 10 feels like doing just above the bare minimum, which is why 12 feels like the number. So when I've talked about who the next schools you could add would be, UNLV has come up. They don't have an amazing pedigree. But they do make they do make some geographic sense. And allow me to explain what it feels uh, a bit like a contradiction there. I think the core of the league is, of course, Oregon State, Washington State, and then the the those four Mountain West and the four American that I talked about. And at that point, I think you're adding schools, n- not necessarily it feels dismissive to call them filler schools, but just kind of like to get you over the hump, to get you to that 12 team mark. And that's why I mentioned schools like San Jose, San Jose State and UNLV, because I think the other schools have kind of done the heavy lifting in terms of rebuilding the conference pedigree. And you're looking for some level of simplicity just, just at that point. But I got a message uh, from somebody about Wyoming and whether or not I was looking, or I was overlooking Wyoming as, as a potential expansion candidate. Let me say this about the Cowboys and and why, if they were a school that ended up in the future Pac-12, I'd be on board with it. I'm not standing here on the front line saying they're a top option because I haven't really mentioned them before. They they have not had a great track record of success. It's why I also think, and I've talked about this going back to last year's shows around this time, UNLV kind of makes sense on paper, not necessarily a top option. I would add schools out of the American Conference before I added UNLV. But if I had four Mountain West and four American and was saying, okay, we do want two more schools, then I'd say, okay, maybe UNLV and San Jose State could could make the most sense along those lines. Or a Utah State, if you wanted to stay in there. Wyoming, it's not as if the travel would be impossible. It'd be a little bit more out of the way, though not a ton. Like it's next to Colorado. So I don't think it's making a huge, huge difference there. There could be travel cost considerations getting there in a league that, you know, is essentially being founded or built up in this hypothetical I'm laying out by two teams that are trying to stay afloat financially. I mean, that's what Oregon State, Washington State were trying to do in their lawsuit, and they've achieved that at least for a couple of years. They'll be able to continue spending, you know, on their coaches' salaries and their departments and NIL and everything like that at the same level they have been roughly for the last couple of years. And, and so, when you introduce Wyoming into that particular picture, what I do love about Wyoming and the idea of adding them is their fan base rocks. I can't say I've watched a bevy of Wyoming sporting events over the years. I've watched a couple. I watched them play Texas Tech. I've seen other football games there. They show up. They show up in a big, big way. And San Diego State has had much better pedigree on the football field. I bet you Wyoming beats them in attendance. And Wyoming's fan base, that is the sort of energy that you want to have. When you're creating, remember what I talked about in in assessing these schools just as football-only entities. What can you bring to the table football-wise? You're trying to create the best television product you can for these hypothetical media rights negotiations in a couple years. And the Mountain West deal is with Fox and CBS. Well, you know who puts a great product on TV? Wyoming. 
You know why? Because their fans love football. And sports in general, I've seen a couple basketball games that place can get rocking, but the football field, every time you got students, you got pass, like it's exactly what it should look like in a in a state as loosely populated as Wyoming. When you're the only game in town, it's small school, you're not competing for national championships, but what else are you gonna do out there? There, that right there. That's what you should be doing. And they do a really great job with that. Now, pedigree wise, they are not high on the list. The, the top four, I think, are pretty easy to define. All you got to do, a quick Google search, who's won the most football games? And, and also just kind of know as a college football fan, who are the top brands? Who are the top brands in the Mountain West? Boise State is unquestionably number one. Fresno State is right behind them at number two. San Diego State and Air Force, you can make an argument for three and four. Uh, I mean, Troy Calhoun's done a fantastic job over there with with the Falcons. I, I mean, they, they win a lot of games every single year. So, that that's why I haven't gotten into Wyoming a lot. The last time they won 10 or more games was 1996. But if you're going back to what I talked about earlier in the show and what football program has had more success, yeah, the answer is Wyoming over UNLV. That much is true. I just wonder if the calculation of ease of travel, geography, save money, and what and, and that sort of stuff doesn't come into play at some point, though it's not the driving factor with these realignment moves. I hope that makes sense. Uh, if if I didn't lay that out clearly, let me know, uh, and I'll be happy to, happy to answer your question. But I think that Wyoming, if, if you got a great fan base, I'm intrigued because you know what makes a game feel big when you're watching it? A great crowd. I'm, I'm a play-by-play guy. You know what I love more than anything in the world? A great crowd. It's electric. Nothing like it. I, I I love doing this stuff. But if you didn't know out there listening to or watching this show, I do play-by-play play for Southern Utah University. And when that basketball arena has got a great crowd, that is my favorite feeling in the world. It is the best. There is nothing like it. So I respect Wyoming in that sense. They've had a good couple of seasons. Beating Texas Tech earlier this year, that's a fantastic win. I mean, that's beating a Big 12 Bowl team right there. That's a, that is a good place to be. They've had some solid seasons. They haven't had such a dominant run of success where I'd consider them a top tier option. But yeah, they could be a candidate. Like I'd certainly take them over, you know, uh, Hawaii, for instance, that has re- or New Mexico. You know, New Mexico hasn't won a whole lot. Hawaii's got uh, a really really difficult travel situation. But yeah, they they could absolutely be an option. I just don't know if they'd be one of the top ones. So, all right, let's move on here. There is one more game. There's only going to be one game in which a, 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 a football team, a college football team, will take the field with a Pac-12 logo on the chest and that's actually still the Pac-12. But got this question from Anthony. What's UW's win in the CFP semifinal mean to the Pac-12 finances for next year? So ordinarily how this works is when a team makes a run, in the postseason, whether that's March Madness or the college football playoff. The team getting to the postseason makes money for the conference, and that money is actually evenly distributed to all member institutions. Now, Oregon State and Washington State worked out in their settlement to get about $6.5 million from each school for the next two years as they depart the league. That's basically what is being left behind to the Beavs and Cougs as the 10 schools go to their new homes. Washington making a run adds to the, the Pac-12 you know, money chest. It's not that significant. It, it's, a, it's about half a million dollars per school. So even if Oregon State, the, the short answer is I'm not sure what is going to happen with that money and whether or not it was factored into the settlement because the settlement was reached before we knew that Washington was going to beat Texas, which makes even more money. I would think that money goes to the PAC 12 and perhaps gets distributed to everyone evenly because it doesn't make that much of a dent. Like it's some money, but it's not, it's not altering it anything in a significant way. So I don't know that Oregon state and Washington state would be, you know, cash grabbing here and saying, Oh, we got to have every single penny and whatnot. Cause they got to, I, I think the settlement was fair. That that's my assessment of it. There's no precedent for it. I just looked at the numbers and said, that seems fair. 
Oregon State and Washington State get a little bit more than they would have, and the other schools have to give them some money because they're screwing them. Yeah, that seems fair to me. So I think that uh, the the Washington game, I think they're going to win, by the way. I, I think they're going to beat Michigan. I do not trust Michigan's offense to keep up with Washington's. Um, I'll talk about that more probably on a Sunday episode uh, of the show, and then we'll react to the national championship on on Monday night. But I, I think that for for the Pac-12, like the finances have been settled and it, it's not going to make a sizable impact one way or the other. If Washington wins or whether or not they decide the money goes here or there, like it's some money, but it's not, it, it's nothing compared. It's a very small slice of the pie. That's the best way to put it. So uh, no need to worry about it in a big, big way. You should be worrying about why you haven't gone to check out FanDuel yet, because that is America's number one sports book. And there's still time to get in on the NFL regular season, which is wrapping up. And the, and right now, right now is the perfect time. New customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Just place it. Whether you win or lose, you get $150 in bonus bets. I don't know that it gets any easier than that. I would lean towards Washington plus four and a half in the national championship game. Vegas has just not been able to figure out the Huskies so far. But if you feel differently, you can put it there. But if it's your first bet, you get 115 bonus bets, whether you're right or wrong. The app is really easy to use, and there are a bunch of different ways to bet, like live same game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab. Maybe you can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, good stuff today. Some good stuff happening in Corvallis. So they did not get Malik Murphy. He's going to Duke with Manny Diaz, the Texas backup quarterback. Pretty crazy that he wasn't in that semifinal game. Just goes to show you, the calendar in college football makes no sense to anybody anywhere in the world. So this question came in from Squeak Here. All right. I immediately thought of Mouse because of Squeak, and then I went Tom and Jerry, so I like your name. What are your thoughts on Oregon State signing four-star quarterback Jabari Johnson from Missouri and four-star Jordan Anderson out of high school? I know you did a podcast on Giovanni McCoy, but was uh, but that was right before those two committed, so I'm curious. I like that there is a looming quarterback battle in Corvallis this year. Why? Because... Malik Murphy, I think, would have been a more proven commodity than either Giovanni McCoy or Jabari Johnson, because those are two guys that have performed in different ways. Johnson more to the 24-7 sports and high school recruiting services to showcase his physical talents, but hasn't really done anything on the field. I don't even know if he took a snap at Missouri this year, but he's a dynamic athlete. So his best work so far has come against high school kids. McCoy, on the other hand, had two really productive years at Idaho under a guy in Jason Eck, who once upon a time was briefly discussed as a coaching candidate on this show for the Oregon State job. The guy's a really good head coach. Idaho was down. Idaho was down in a bad way, and he brought the Kibbe Dome to life. I was talking about Wyoming's fan base earlier. The Kibbe Dome, that place is electric, and he's made them into a good program. Over the last couple of years, Giovanni McCoy has been at the center of that. Now, making the transition from FCS to FBS, even though Oregon State is no longer playing a Power 5 schedule next year, I think it's kind of you know Mountain West Plus or Power 5 adjacent, however you want to uh, look at it. They've got seven Mountain West games, four Power 4, Power 5 games, and then one FCS by game. So I, I think that's you know slightly stronger than your typical Mountain West schedule. I, I haven't looked at all of them, to be fair, but I think that's still going to be a step up. For Giovanni McCoy, I'm confident in saying that because the Mountain West still a significantly better conference than than the Big Sky, which is a great, not a good, a great FCS football conference. If you're bringing in two guys that are unproven commodities, I want them to battle it out. I want them to push each other. And I hope it's a tight battle if I'm an Oregon State fan. And the reason is that if those two guys are going at it and it's not decided who the starter is going to be. It means both are playing at a competitive level. Now, I am not a fan of a two-quarterback system. I am a fan of let's let these guys battle it out. 
Ben Goldbranson's in the room as well with plenty of starting experience. Did not play well in the Sun Bowl, but that was a pretty shorthanded Oregon State team with an interim coaching staff. Let those guys battle it out. Whoever emerges, he's the starter. But if it's a close, tight battle and they don't declare a starter early and they declare one very late before their season opener, then you're going to have a situation in which the guy who is playing is is feeling a sense of urgency to play well because he knows, hey, I beat that guy in fall camp, but I'm a three interception game away from giving way to the other dude. So if you aren't able to get the highest level talent that that was out there for Oregon State, and that was Malik Murphy. Oregon State had him on campus for a visit. He chooses to go to Duke, which I understand Duke's playing in a better conference than Oregon State in 2024. So if you're Oregon State, this is you making the best of a rather unfortunate situation. And having Gold Branson in there also, I think, adds a level of, of baseline competition to the room. So who they're going to be throwing to, boy, you'd love to see Oregon State go get a guy or two in the transfer portal that's got either some experience somewhere or someone who has a lot of talent but doesn't have as much experience but could come and maximize that talent. And, and that's where I think Jordan Anderson's head was at, you know, a one-time Oregon commit deciding he's going to go to Oregon State instead. Four-star wide receiver. He was one of the early commits in Oregon's 2024 cycle. That class evolved, and they went after Jeremiah McClellan, who was a top 100 player, and Ryan Pelham, who was a top 150, and flipped those guys from Ohio State and USC. So I think Anderson perhaps knew that those moves were coming and decided, well, I want to go somewhere where I can play. I don't know that there's a better spot to play at a relatively high level right away than Oregon State. No Silas Bolden. No Anthony Gould. That, that, that's, that's a wide receiver room that after those two guys, your next best option this year was Jack Velling, the tight end. He's not there either. So if you're taking out the top three receiving targets for Oregon State quarterbacks from a year ago, that's a skill position room that is wide open. I mean, wide, wide open. And I think bringing in a guy of that caliber from the high school ranks is indicative of the fact that he thinks he can play early and often. And if I'm Oregon State, that's the sort of guy that I want to be taking a chance on. That's the sort of guy who I want to go to and make a pitch, as they clearly have, of, hey, you can go sit and maybe play in year two or three at Oregon. I mean, Oregon's got a kid by the name of Kyler Casper, who was a highly rated four-star recruit, reclassified to the 2022 class, He has not cracked the starting rotation or anything resembling it at this point. He is six foot five, has got great hands, great leaping ability, tremendous ball skills, high end speed. He's not playing. He's not playing over there. So Anderson probably saw guys like that and said, well, or Oregon State probably went to Anderson and said, hey, those guys over there are really talented. They're not playing either. Come here and you can play as a true freshman. I think that Anderson is someone who, when he was committed to Oregon, I felt, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm on board with this guy. I see his upside. It's definitely there. And this is a glaring need for Oregon State. So I like all of those moves for that reason. I like the competition in the quarterback room. I like bringing in talent any opportunity you get because it's just tough to come by for the Beavs right now. It's really, really tough to come by. So I, I think they're doing a great job or a, a, as great a job as they can with maximizing the amount of talent they can put on their roster for 2024. And don't forget, they brought over a couple of guys from Colorado who, you know, at the very least will be depth pieces along the offensive line. Anthony Hankerson, the running back, I think it's a solid number two to Damian Martinez. So I think they're doing a decent job. That's that's how I'd assess Oregon State right now. They're doing a decent job getting Anderson. Uh, that, that's a pretty that's a pretty solid pull there for, for Oregon State. Last one here, question from Bud. Seems like much of the Pac-12 success this year in football was due to their improved level of coaching across the board. How do you feel about the current level of coaching in Pac-12 basketball? I think the success in football was twofold. Coaching, yes. Quarterback play. Quarterback play was big. I think you have a lot of really good coaches in Pac-12 basketball. I don't know if there is the same level of talent on the hardwood as there was 
on the gridiron this season because there are plenty of talented players in the Pac-12, but there are, I think, a greater supply of good coaches relative to the number of great players that you have. So, you know, Caleb Love down at Arizona, the transfer from North Carolina, is fantastic. Jackson Shellstad, the freshman at Oregon, is really good. I think that the coaches in the Pac-12 are, are real solid across the board. I, I think Mark Madsen will eventually do well at Cal. I think that Jared Haas still being at Stanford, they just beat number four Arizona at home inexplicably. I, I don't know. I, I, I struggle trusting Jared Haas because I've just seen what his Stanford teams do year in and year out. They're never bottom dwellers, but they're never ascending. They're just kind of stuck in neutral there. But you look at what like Tad Boyle is doing with Colorado. That looks like they'll be a tournament team. If Oregon gets their bigs healthy, they can. Uh, Dana Altman is fantastic, and Mick Cronin's got a young team. US uh, USC also has uh, a, a decent amount of youth there. But Mick Cronin at UCLA as a fantastic coach, fantastic coach, and I think they're the best example. They don't have the talent right now because they're so young and lost so much from last year to match where their coach is at. So you look at the Pac-12 and say, "Wow, USC and UCLA are terrible." But it's because they just don't have the right combination of guys. USC's got some talented players. They're underperforming, I think, far more than UCLA. The, the Bruins are just in for a rebuild year. Mick Cronin can really coach. And the last two years, Oregon hasn't made the tournament. Dana Altman can really coach. And by the way, Wayne Tinkle at Oregon State, he's had his ups and downs, but he could be in for a, a rebound year right now. They're off to a better start than they have been. So, I, I think that's where the difference is. I think you've got great coaches, but is the talent always there? Not in every single instance. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.